For more on what the deal means for the chip space overall and NVIDIA in particular, let's bring in Stacey Raskin, the Bernstein Research U.S. Semiconductors Analyst. Stacey, it's great to have you with us on this day after Christmas. Uh, this is an yeah. interesting proposition because Jonathan Ross and his team of engineers were some of the ones behind the Google Alphabet tensor processing unit type products out there. Just how much does this change the landscape within chips overall? Yeah, so th th what they're doing, so he, he did, Jonathan Ross was the um, creator of the first generation of, of the TPU back in, I, I can't remember when it was, almost a decade ago. Um, what Grok is doing is, is not a TPU per se, but they've got some very interesting uh, architectures for high bandwidth, um, a low latency inference. And so I think that's where this comes comes to play. Like, you know, in, NVIDIA... There's always this narrative out there for NVIDIA that they're not winners in, in inference. I, I have not been a believer in that, but but that narrative has been out there. Um, by effectively, I know they're not acquiring the whole company, but effectively acquiring the company and the personnel and, and the technological talent, it gives NVIDIA the ability to integrate some of those architectural innovations into, into their, presumably into their future roadmap. I think it also massively improves that narrative, this idea that they can't be a winner in inference. Um, I think that 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 bear case gets a lot harder to argue with this. Um, I also thought it was interesting, you know, it, it, it's, it's funny, you, you talked about this being the largest deal they've done, which is true, but they're so big now that they can, they can do a $20 billion deal on Christmas Eve with no press release and, like, nobody bats an eye. Like, relative to their market cap, this is not very big. Like, it, it's, it's actually a very small uh, bolt-on. Um, so taking that, I mean, so it's, what that means is the risk for them, I think, should be relatively low. All right, Stacey, if this is not that big of a deal in terms of the overall assets as a percentage of balance sheet that NVIDIA is putting to work right now, how much could this change the paradigm or construct with which other chip companies view their product lineups and their pipelines? Do they all need to kind of diversify a little bit more? I'm sorry, could you repeat that again? Um, I lost sure. you for a second. Yeah, Stacey, I I'm wondering if other chip companies have to kind of follow through and diversify a little bit of their own product portfolios and pipelines given this type of a deal with NVIDIA and Grok? Well, you have to remember most of the other chip companies out there in AI are having a hard time competing anyways, <laughs> right? So it's hard enough for them to compete in their own core markets without worrying about diversifying. But I think it actually widens the gap or widens the moat that NVIDIA has had over their competition. It certainly is going to make it tougher for the competition to compete. Stacey, thoughts on Intel? I mean, it's had a, the stock. The stock has had a great year. It's up 79%. Yeah. It, it, it really has. And not really, like, from any sort of fundamental basis, but, I, I mean, fine. Um, you know, the, in the near term, their markets should be better. PCs have been pretty strong on, on some of the upgrades and, and, and Windows end-of-life refreshes and servers, which have been very weak for the last several years. Um, server CPUs are... are um, and undergoing a cycle now. So those things are, are good. It's good for their competition as well. Structurally, they're still in a very tough spot, though. I mean, their, their process tech is still, I mean, they're still ramping their, their new process. The yields are not great. They've even admitted this, that they, the yields are, are, are not super. Um, any kind of foundry customers that, I mean, there's a lot of hope around that, but it's still going to be years before we ever see anything there material, if at all. Um, and in those core markets, they're still losing a, a, a ton of share. Um, I think they've, and, and, and clearly, as we all know, they're still burning a lot of cash. Um, I think they've got a lot of fundamental issues. Now, at the same time, you know, there is more support. And I think I've said it on, on, on you know, your channel in the past, like Donald Trump wants the stock to go up is a bull case of sorts. It's not my kind of bull case. Um, but a lot of that, uh, the governmental intervention and then the subsequent investments from others on the wake of that are the reasons that the, that the stock has become supported. I mean, they're being started to view as, as too big to fail. I'm not sure I agree with that, frankly, but that is a perception that has developed. Um, I still think it's going to be a slog, though. I, I mean, look, I, I've said before it took 10 years to break it. It's going to take 10 years to fix it. You know, 10 years, they started in 2020. 10 years would be 2030. It's probably going to be, you know, in, in that time frame before we really know um, if this turnaround is really going to be successful or not.